something special today because the very first day that I found out that this rice right here was made, produced and packaged in Ghana, I was so much impressed to the extent that I told myself I'm no longer eating any rice apart from nanas rice. And you know how I always do it. If something is produced in my country, I feel so proud, but I know and believe that they don't know the person behind it. And this is why Wodomaya is here. I'm going to the farm to interview the guy who actually made and produced this rice right here in Ghana. And I know and believe that you also want to find out, yeah? But before I go, Africans are creative. Africans are talented. Africans can do it. So do me a favor, if you're an African, like this video. Even if you're not an African, but you enjoy watching What Up My Hair, make sure you like this video. Subscribe and help us reach a million subscribers. You know what? I'm not going to give you some of my food because I think my whole room is full. Everybody's going to enjoy my best meal because this is the best meal in the entire world. Like the video and come with me as I take you guys to the farm. I am my hair. The man behind the nest rice. Do you know that I've actually tried your rice before? Wow, I hope you loved it. You know, based on what I ate, that's why I did research and I got to know that you're actually the guy behind the nest rice, man. It's a pleasure meeting you, man. Thank you, man. I never knew that something like this actually exists in Ghana. That was our hope. Um, we get that feedback a lot. A lot of people are, are surprised about the ability for Ghanaians to produce um, products like that. But for us, that's, that's one of our passions. Tonight. My first question to ask is, are Ghanaians consuming your rice? I hope so. Yes, we are I'll... selling all what we are producing. Well, what, what do you mean by you hope so? So, Ghanaians are consuming our rice. Um, our goal is to get it in the hands of as many Ghanaians as possible because the feedback from anybody who tries the rice is that, how have I not heard about this rice or how have I not reached this? How, how can I get this rice more often? So I will say that Ghanaians... Are, are, you, are you convincing Ghanaians enough that the nest rice is here to stay? Yes, I hope so. All the steps you are taking is to make sure that Ghanaian rice is here to stay. You will never eat Ghanaian rice and need it again and will not be available. That is my promise to you. You see, I'm a big fan of rice because I lived in China, so I've been eating rice every single day. I'm a big fan of fufu, but I, I eat rice more than fufu, to be honest. Anytime I travel, I just want to eat rice. But the first time I got hold of Ghanaian rice, I mean, we cooked and later I went to check. Uh, no, this <laughs> looks different. And I checked, it's Nana, and I had to do research, and I got to know you. It's a pleasure meeting you, but is Nana your full name? Yes, that, so Nana is my only first name. Mm -hmm. Ousu Echao is my last name. But it's very important for me to note, Nana's first is not because my name is Nana. Oh. What is the most common Ghanaian name you know? Kobina. <laughs> So, for me, I, I actually put it out online. I was like, hey guys, if we start producing our own rice, what do you think we should name it? Mm. But for me, the goal always has been, we need to send this rice to the end of the world. Like, we recognize that, look, growing rice from here is like growing rice from the center of the world. And that alone is a very big deal. Fantastic. So, we wanted to be able to project this image of things that are made from Africa or things that are made from Ghana does not mean that they are inferior. And so, we are very happy to be exporting this rice today to Belgium, to Germany, to... We even have a client who is in uh, China who actually wants to take our product and then, and then distribute it in Shanghai. But why do Africans believe that whatever is produced in Africa is inferior? I'm guessing that they didn't know the things that we know today, which is that technology makes a difference. The youth, if they get involved in agriculture, the, the, the future of agriculture on the continent is going to be a completely different story. I just want to tell you that I'm so proud of you uh, because you're so young, you know, and I've been telling young people to get into agriculture because agriculture is the future of Africa. I agree. Do you I believe agree. that? I agree. In fact, we have a program that is basically tailored to the youth in Africa. So at AgroKings, we took, in fact, we've acquired a, quite a large tract of land. What we're doing with that is we've dedicated a portion of that land. So approximately 100 acres of our land is available. We have our tractors in place, we have all the farm implements in place, and our goal with that is to make sure that if you wanted to get into agriculture, you mm. wanted to farm, let's say, one acre of chili pepper, you wanted to farm one acre of lettuce, you have an opportunity to come to our farm, rent the land from us for a year, for two years, for three years. Wow. Similar like you rent rent, you could rent a house, and then you're able to produce whatever you want to produce on the farm. That's a if great you initiative. don't even have the know-how to produce on the farm, we will give you like some people that could help you to be able to do that. So this is one of our exciting projects that we are executing at Agrokins because I believe strongly that more youth need to get into agriculture. That's really a great initiative, man. But hey, I mean, we're talking about your farm, farm, farm. Let me come to you. Who are you, man? Dude, I, um, I wish I could say I'm a village boy. But, ah, I, no. <laughs> <laughs> but I did grab the village. So I grew up in the city. I was born in Accra. 
Mm. Um, born, raised in Accra, yeah. I, I went to Prempe College, which was in Kumase. I was in the boarding all-boys school. Um, and then that was a very good experience for me. I think a lot of what I've learned of who I've become today in terms of discipline was learned at, um, at, at this boarding school. Yes, Prempe College. Big shout out to Prempe <laughs> College, man. Yeah, to all the amount for a big shout out to you yeah. guys. Um, and then I moved to the U.S. for college um, education. Mm. Initially, I wanted to do aeronautical engineering, similar, to, similar to you. This guy knows me a lot. Eh? <laughs> okay. And then so, what happened? So um, I realized, look, Ghana Airways is not working. So if I chose to do aeronautical it just meant I was going to probably end up outside of Ghana. Mm. And so I switched to an area or a field that I felt like Ghana needed more of. And surprisingly, it's not agriculture. I went into computer science and information systems. So I'm, I'm more of a tech, tech type of guy. Um, so that's what I decided to do for, for, for college. I made engineering a minor and I mm. added business as well because mm. I realized, listen, I needed to be business astute so I did computer science information systems and business and I had uh, engineering um, I stopped that in, in my second year and then I moved back to Ghana um, right in 2012 I, I, I had an opportunity to be on Wall Street I said hey you know what if I start this job I'll have a very hard time moving out can, can you know come down a little bit can, can you get closer Let's check if something is wrong with this brain man because the, the Africa we're talking about right now Majority of the youth want to get this opportunity, totally go to the state, Europe, and just go live there and never come back to the continent. You got an opportunity to work at what? Wall the Wall Street. Street. And you gave it up. Yeah. Somebody said, uh, they are telling me to ask you, is everything okay with you? No, I, 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 I don't think so. I think everything is not okay with me, but I hope that what is wrong with me will, be, will, will affect more people. <laughs> Because I think that that's the, that's the difference maker for us here in Africa. Amazing. I think that the fact that, look, all the effort I could have been putting out in, in, in these Wall Street companies, mm -hmm. if I brought that to Ghana, the difference I could make is like enormous. Look, okay. You came to Ghana in the year 2012. 2012. Yes. What were you doing in the year 2012 then? So in 2012, I came and I started working. In fact, I interviewed with some of the um, auditing firms in Ghana, but mm. I ended up choosing to work with my dad, um, who was in the real estate industry. The real estate industry sounded more exciting to me. Mm -hmm. I felt like there was an opportunity to make a difference in that in mm. that space. So I started working in the real estate industry. In fact, the engineering side of me came out again. So I worked there for about a year. Mm -hmm. And then I got a what I'll call a, a, a small breakthrough. A, a customer, I, I, a friend of mine, needed a house because mm. we were about to get married. They mm. needed a house that was affordable. And so I decided to help them out with that house. I had mm. a way of doing some construction work mm. that would allow me to provide them the house at a cheaper price, price. point. So then they allowed me to, 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 they took a shot at me. If that was the first time I saw $50,000, no, they gave me $49,500. It was in cash. I went to the house that, that evening, then they counted it for me, and then I took that out. But I executed that project really well. So since then, that was in 2013, March of 2013. Mm. Since that particular project, I have always had real estate projects that I was um, working on, even till date. And from real estate now, you are into Agriculture. farming. Mm -hmm. I mean, what brought you here, man? <laughs> Uh, funny story, but I think that this is where serendipity works, right? So I come out to the Akuse area, okay. hoping to find a piece of land to do a real estate project. I get out there, and then when we are done inspecting the land, the chief comes out and says, hey, now you should try the rice that uh, people produce. So I say, hey, you know, sure. So in fact, he didn't give me the option. He said, you must try the rice. So he literally brought it and put it in the car. So when I got, to, I got, I got into Accra, I tried the rice. I was like, this is really good. Mm. Prior to that, I was, I was eating imported rice. I mean, I, I didn't know too much about local rice. I just, look, I loved my imported rice. I was buying that and it was good. But this tasted better. So I came back again while I was following up on the price and I realized, hey, I want some of the rice that you gave me the last time. But then they didn't, what they gave me didn't taste like the first one. Mm. When I found out, I said, oh no, Nana, producing that rice is a little bit more expensive. So then I realized, look, how about, I, I said, how much more expensive? Then mm -hmm. he gave me the price. I said, that's not much. How about I finance the farmer so I produce that type of rice? Even if I'm the only person who consumes okay. it, I'm fine. So that's what I did. I had like two farmers. I gave them the money. It was a total of about 14,000 CDs at the time. I gave, no, 12,000 CDs. I gave them the money and I had to make a, a margin on that money. But that worked out really well. The two farmers worked excellently. We did a bit of training for them to produce certain quality. Um, it was, it was was really good and I, I think that inspired you to start your own farm yes so I continued that I went I went so I worked with them for about two two I worked with two the first year the second season I worked with 25 of them the next season I worked with 100 this year I working with about 300 of them already and yes that 
because before when I came here, look, I will go into the town trying to meet all my 25 farmers. But that process will take me like two weeks. Because of course the roads are not always the best. So you are sitting on motorbikes. I look I, before I came to the farm, I was not a motorbike person. Today I'm riding motorbikes. But just because look, the road network in the time at the time was not very good. Yeah. So you can't get to all these corners without a bike. So then was a guy who was always taking me around, but I couldn't get through all the farms. So I realized, look, it's about time we acquired a tract of land ourselves mm. so that we can even bring the farmers who are doing really well to come and farm on our land while we also do some of the farming ourselves. So wow. this is basically what has um, allowed us to scale to this point. So how many acres do you have right now? <laughs> ah, he, he's laughing. <laughs> Should I also laugh some? Ah, how many acres do you have now? A few, a few thousands. What a is few, a few thousands? A few thousands. And uh, note that probably, uh, uh, Lord willing, will probably be one of the largest rice farms uh, uh, pretty soon. Largest farm? Yeah, rice farms. An acre region within? Uh, a couple thousands. Don't worry, stay tuned. You'll probably see that. <laughs> and I, if he doesn't tell me, how will I know? You know, uh, so, you, you know, right now you are cultivating that amount. Yeah, no, so right now we are cultivating. So we just moved here last year. Okay. Good part. Look, I would not say COVID was a good thing. Um, but it forced us to, to focus on important things. Um, you know, at the point of COVID, we're wondering, look, what's going to happen with importation of products into the country? Borders were closed. You could see necessity was laid on everybody. Yeah. Everybody had to think differently. Everybody had to do things differently. So at that point, we, we focused more on agricultural production. Mm. So we moved to our actual... Our, we, we started the acquisition project in 2019. Yeah. I moved here officially in 2020. Okay. So when there was lockdown, we moved out here and then we started developing the land for our rice cultivation. So at the moment, we are cultivating on about 300 acres. We have prepared about 1,000 acres as at last month. Okay. So we are... We are yeah. And, and how many people are working for you right now? On my management team. So my team that admin staff that's in the office is approximately 32 people. Um, on the larger side, which on the farm and stuff, we are probably around 1,000, 1,500 um, um, people that we employ. On this farm specifically, maybe, hmm, I'll have to check the numbers of my operations guys, but I think it's somewhere in the region of 100 to 200 people at the moment. And we are doing a lot of mechanization. So for us, we have a lot of, you know, tractors that are doing some of the services and things like that. But yes, we'll de because our farm is not fully functional yet. But when we are fully functional, we'll probably be employing it. I read somewhere that... Let um, me give you perspective. Okay. When my whole farm is operational, uh -huh. we'll be employing a minimum of about 20,000 people. When the whole farm is operational. So that, that should give you some perspective about how much land we have. Then I will say that, no, I'll calculate because I'm a mathematician. <laughs> it's roughly around 9,000 to 10,000 acres, true or false. Uh, uh, I'll leave that to your, to your, no, to our audience. Because you say in 200 out. acres, we have over, no, you said 300 acres, yes, we have over 20,000. Yeah, exactly. No, no, the 2, people. people. Yeah, exactly. 20,000 people. Exactly. Yeah. Multiply it. You yeah. see, it to give you 10,000. <laughs> yeah. I read somewhere that majority of the people that works for you are female. Yes. 60%. Yes. So, so that's my management team. Why, um, why female? What I realized, they are better caretakers. Um, Woody, um, 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 take it or leave it. I have, um, we started out, even at tractor operators, um, um, the person who leads all our mechanization efforts, so the person who runs all our tractors and machines is actually a female. Wow. Our principal farm manager is a female. Wow. Um, on my management team, six of us, four of them are female, they are two male, which includes myself. Hmm. And, and if you look at the things that we do, how we do it, you realize, you, you see the touch. I'll not say much, but yes. And, 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 and empowering females is very important to us. For instance, we just ran a program with GIZ, the, the German um, um, NGO, mm. um, and we were planning to employ more females because as we're expanding the farm, like I said, we've prepared 10,000. Yeah. 1,000... Uh, <laughs> 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 okay, <laughs> let's continue. <laughs> With all the new equipment uh -huh. we're acquiring, we realized that we need more female in the space because exactly. you know, tractor, tractors are typically operated by yeah. female. So we went to GIZ and we said, hey, can we run a program together where we could empower more females? Mm -hmm. So we just opened up the application for about a week. Just to, we're hoping to get about 10 women. We bring them on board. We train them to operate tractors. We give them a portion of the field to prepare. Yeah. And then we could ship them out, out to other farms. Yeah. So we started this program hoping to get maybe 50 applications. Look, in a week, we got 600 applications. Wow. And we only had 10 slots available. So that just tells you the need that is missing. Um, and, and you'd wonder, why women attract operators? Look, when you see them operate the machine, 
how much care they take for the machine, sure. making sure they wash it almost every week, making sure that the boat and stuff are always tight in place. It's like taking care of a child. Who does that better than, than, than moms? The woman. So, yes, that's, that's a bit about our story around um, a woman. And yes, if, for instance, you probably, when you live here today, you may receive a hamper of all our products. Mm. Ideas like this don't come from, from, from us men, man. Cancel but like woman. almost of the time, whenever we are done with the meeting, like, hey, Nana, I think that we need to send this care package to this person. I think that we need to send this package to this person. During COVID, we did a lot of donations because we went to places like in Fadama, just because of that, you know, female touch. One of our taglines, um, in fact, our major tagline is advancing human lives. Okay. And yes, I can talk to you a little bit more about that. But yes, let's, 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 let me let you <laughs> ask the question. Is rice the only thing that you are, I mean, cultivating in no, here? No, no, no. So in here, you, we have a lot of rice being produced. Um, it's our major crop. Mm. We have pigs. We have about uh, 40 pigs here um, on, the, on the farm with us. And um, we have about a thousand bed poultry farm that's also wow. out here. Um, we have about 50 acres of different vegetables. So we do chili pepper, sweet potatoes, okra, lettuce, and things like that. So, yeah. My goal, look, eventually is... And this, 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 this is all about youth and agriculture. Mm. And I'm sure most of your audience that are... And, and I'm sure most of them are actually in the, in the diaspora. Some of mm. them are local. Mm. My hope is, look, you should visit our farm. And then over 90% of what you consume should be locally produced right here from the farm. Because how much... You've probably never seen what even a pepper plant looks like or what a sweet potato plant looks like. And for me, that was my story. But for me, I'm hoping that when you come over to, to the farm, you are probably served with some rice. And we have rice juice. We, mm. we'll, we'll launch a product um, out later. But <laughs> relax, relax, relax. R rice juice? Yeah, rice juice, rice juice. Stay tuned, stay tuned. Um, so we want almost everything you consume at least... 90% of it should have been produced on the farm. So that when you leave the kitchen or when you leave wherever you ate the food, mm. you can literally go see, hey, this is what tomato actually looks like. This is what chili pepper actually looks like. This is what sweet potato actually looks like. When you have fries with burgers, you want to see what that sweet potato looks like. And, and those are the stuff that really excite me. Because I think that those are the kinds of things the youth are looking for. That kind of authenticity, that kind of natural feel, and taste, and to, to, to things. Let me know, right now you have um, the rice farm, you're cultivating after harvesting. Mm -hmm. Do you add another value to the rice? Yes. So, so we, we, will con we don't only add value. I'll not stop there. We will continue to add value. My goal is that at the end of probably in the next 12 to 18 months, mm. there should be zero waste, which means every single thing we produce none of it should go to waste. When we started in the industry, about 45% of what you produce in rice, rice cultivation goes to waste. The chaff and a lot of other things that kind of go to waste. But we are actually finding ways to continue innovating. So we have, you know, our rice is, comes in two variants. There's yeah. a long grain, there's a short grain variant. Then, in fact, when you, when you produce rice, there are, there are about four grades of rice. Grade one is what is kept in our long grain packaging. Mm. Grade two stays in our... In our in a broken or green packaging. Grade three and grade four, we're actually using for a cereal. So we have a cereal that, um, that's, that you, you, you probably see out in the market Very by soon. December. Yes, but so we continue to innovate around. So for us, once, like I said, which I just mentioned rice juice, it's not public. Mm. We launched the rice juice at Joe Meto's event, which was about two or three months ago. Mm. Um, and we have a chef who's been kind of continually innovating around this. Because for us, look, unfortunately, a lot of the good production that happens in Ghana, I don't mm. want to shake tables, but I think it's important because I want us to be authentic. Yeah. A lot of good produce we produce gets shipped out of the, outside of Ghana. And then we get left with the leftover. Because now most of the time when somebody is thinking about, about farming, their first thing is, oh, can we export it somewhere? Why should we export for them to give us back what they add value to, when we can add the value right here? And for us, that's been very important. So... In fact, the first time we got into the uh, vegetable farm, we had a guy who said he was going to export it. We sent it to the airport. I sent him 2,000 kilos of potatoes. He took the best, which was about 200 kilos, and gave me the 1,800 that I should take it back. And, I, and that, was, that for me was a changing point. I was like, look, we are going to add value to our own product. Mm. We are going to be able to sell this product to our people. The good one that you want to export, <coughs> I'd rather sell it to my local guys. And that's what we've been doing. So you consistently see, look, don't be surprised if you see us produce 10 different products out of our same rice variant. Because we only started out with long grain rice. Then we added the short grain. Then we added the cereal. Then we've added juice. 
Only God knows what's next. It's okay, don't just put me in the water, man. That's okay. 10,000 acres. How? Dude, I never said anything like okay, that. After acres. doing my calculation, I think it's 10,000 acres, yeah? But uh, how do you get the whole farm? Because I think it's so huge. Yeah, yeah. So so we have a there's a, there's a, there's a lagoon that's a collection of rainwater. Okay. Um, down, it's about 25 hectares of rainwater that's mm. been gathered. Um, and then beyond that, there's also the Volta River. But we don't get there yet. Um, for the acreage we have now, yeah. um, we should be fine with our lagoon. So we have a water pump that's at the water station that's down there and we could, I could probably show you the water station soon and then we pump the water and then it flows by gravity. So after one pump, all this water that flows over three kilometers down, down there's probably over seven kilometers, all the water flows from one single pump because we have a way of sloping it that when I drop water there, it goes all the way to the end of the farm. Which means getting the land for rice, I think you need to stay close to water. Yes. Rice, rice needs, needs a lot water. Of water. Yes. Wow. Even for us on our farm, we do a lot of recycling of the water. So the water that comes in and floods the field, it goes down a certain canal and then it goes back to the water and then it gets pumped again. So it's not like we are always we we are using mm. new fresh water. We are using a lot of rain fed and then when we need water, we are actually able to channel it this way. Don't you think that it's time for Africans to grow what they eat? I agree. In fact, our tagline at the back of all us, all our shirts and all us, I eat local. Because we think that it's time that we... Look, I had a South African visitor come in mm. to Ghana. Um, this was around 2005. Again, this is before I even got significantly there. Yeah. He came all the way from South Africa looking for land to grow. I think at the time he was actually looking to do cattle rearing. But somebody said, look, for me to do cattle rearing, I need a large tract of land to grow some of what the cattle will be eating. Mm. So we went all the way to Bronga Afro region and to go and look at the land, if it was good enough. Before the guy got out of the car, he's like, listen, I don't even need to get out of the car to know that this soil is good. And his point is, look, it is criminal for this country or this continent to import food. And for me, that was a big wake up call. <laughs> look, we have so much arable land, it makes... 60% of... I mean, the world arable land is in Africa. Yet, we even import food to eat, yes. which is we so the, sad. We are the largest importers, actually. Corporate or entrepreneurship? Both. Why? Because there's no way I could have built this by myself. There's no way on earth. Um, there's a great team that actually works with me. And not people who didn't have an opportunity, but people who had op options of either being outside, either being even in Ghana or working with large corporate mm. firms, you know, the mm. PwC's, KPMG's, mm. Deloitte's um, and, and the likes. But some of these people who would forego these opportunities, and I use the word forego because for the first couple of years, and we are still in that phase, we are still in that growth phase where I can't pay you what PwC will pay you. Yeah. I can't pay you what KPMG will pay you. But if you supported me today, we know that we are going somewhere. So I realize that it's important for some people, not everybody is called to be an entrepreneur. Yeah. Others will all have local champions, which are yeah. small, small companies, but I don't think that can make enough of a difference. We need to be able to build some small companies that have capacity to grow and become large companies. And so this is why I would say for some people, they would have to go corporate. For some people, they will have to come the entrepreneurial route. And most importantly, the corporate people, if possible, they should support some of the entrepreneurs. Do you believe that Africa is the future? No doubt. On all fronts, I think that on the financial side, Africa is the future. The profit-making side, Africa is the future. Population side, Africa is the future. In fact, we have the long, youngest population in the world. And so I can't think of any other future apart from Africa. And um, if you think Africa is the future, then who are the future of Africa? The youth. So why is it that the youth don't want to stay in Africa? Everybody is saying that we need to go out there for greener pastures. Uh, uh, you and I know the answer to this question. Tell me, the know. hustle here is real. The hustle here is real. Look, the road leading here is not even one that excites you, right? Exactly. You, you spoke about, look, great roads in Namibia. Roads leading to rural areas are not exciting. Look, I'm, I'm in a town or in an area where there's no clean water. There's no electricity in this side of the town. So we are, but we are happy because you are forced to empower the, the, the city with using solar power, which, which for me is, is way more exciting than using regular power. So, so which means you use solar panels? Yes, yes. We even, we've built mud houses with solar panels on top of them. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so yes, I, the hassle here is real. You lived abroad before? Yes. Will, five years. Five years. Will you tell people out there to come back home or you think that it's not necessary? Yes, I think, I think they, yeah, they should come back home. Why should they come back home? Because... The hope, 
most of the opportunities that are untapped, they know. Some people in Ghana may not know. Not that Ghanaians don't know. Because you see, truth be told, exposure makes a difference. Thank you. Your, 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 you don't know what you don't know. You can't see what you've never seen. Mm. So it's like some, some people who are out there have this experience. Like I, I knew the technology I saw outside and I knew what we lacked locally. Mm. And that's why I said, listen, let me go tap into what you've done well. Let me bring it back into, the, into an economy that hasn't done this well enough. So yes, most of them, if not all need to. Some of them should stay there because I'm shipping my rice there. <laughs> uh, so some of them should stay there to buy it. But yes, for, for most of them, I, 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 I wish they came back. Uh, if you had a chance to change one thing in Africa, what would you change? What would I change? If I could change something, the heart that the leaderships of these African countries mm -hmm. have for the country, whether old or young. I don't think they have a good heart. Uh, I said it. It's not, okay. You got you got just left group. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I don't think they have a good heart. I feel like it cut across the entire continent. Yeah. Because sometimes when I, I travel within Africa and sometimes when I'm traveling within Africa I get sad. Yeah. Like if these people care about the continent, trust me, the continent won't be the way it is. Yeah. I mean I wish I had visited more countries in Africa than I've visited outside the country, outside, outside of the continent. But it's more difficult. Very. Look, we have orders in Côte d'Ivoire, Togo. It's cheaper for me to send my product to Belgium than to Côte d'Ivoire. But, I, look, I don't get sick of that. No, 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 continue, I'm not getting continue. Oh, no, 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 Nana no, no. Uh -huh. just left group. group. Nana just come back. <laughs> I've ordered you back. Come on. Continue. See, this is something that I've always been talking about. You know, Intercontinental trade between African countries is very, very difficult, man. Even traveling from here to Togo is tough than me traveling all the way from here to China. Yeah. Now, let me know, yeah, the major challenge you face starting this, man. Look, land acquisition was a challenge. The chiefs, even to this day, Though I'm the only person who comes for these meetings subsequently, they keep saying, whenever we go meet some other set of chiefs or whatever, they keep saying, oh, so his father came to acquire some land, but right now he sent the son. Dude, I brought my father just to show the older face, but I'm actually the one who is here actually doing all the work. So you realize that even among some of the traditional leaders, they don't respect the, fuck that. the, the youth. Um, so that's one of the challenges. But uh, machinery is also big. Um, there are not enough machines for local people to build commercial size farms. It almost looks like you have to raise a couple million dollars to be able to get the machinery you need to be able to do a rice farm. Um, so those are some of the challenges that you, you face on that front. But as a business, I would say that, um, so those were some of the farming challenges. And I think, okay, one other thing that's important is skilled personnel. Mm. There's not a lot of real facts or figures on the ground, mm. not on paper. Because look, if anybody tells you to get into vegetable farming, the Excel sheet looks fantastic. Well, it looks good. You take all your money and put it into it. Oh, but God. oftentimes, the returns are not the way it looks on the Excel sheet. So there are very few people who have the skill of doing not just what is in the book, but also have experience with what's in the ground. Um, for us, we, what has allowed us to build this side of a farm, we have oh. like Brazilian um, farm managers and agronomists who work with us, who allow us to be able to build out what we've been able to build out. But on the business front, distribution is a major challenge. You'll be surprised to know that I struggle to get Ghanaian stores to pick my product. Because for them, even by looking at the package, they think this is too expensive. Some people don't even believe it's made in Ghana just because, and it, I remember there was, a, there was a customer we have who said, uh, this doesn't, Look like. Ga Ghana doesn't deserve this type of product. In, in three, this is what he said. Where the ense Ghana, and he just tells you the mindset of the Ghanaian to the Ghanaian product. That look, we actually have an ability to produce excellent products as well. And so yes, distribution has been a major challenge for us. Last mile distribution. Now, how do you do your distribution in terms of um, if somebody want to reach out to you, how do you do it? So our website has, um, we've built out this, uh, like I said, I'm a techie. Mm. So on our website, you could go on there, you put in your current location, we'll be able to show you the stores that are closest to you. And then we can actually help you navigate to get there with the phone number on there as well. I want to say thank you so much for sharing your story with me. I really appreciate your time.